Hi everyone, um, my name is Joshua Nichols. I am a neuroscience and biotechnology student at the Swinburne University of Technology. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the brain and depression. Uh, most notably, I'm going to be talking about the current science of depression, the uh, limitations, and more importantly, the um, new paradigm which I'm working on. So a quick overview of this lecture. I'm going to be talking, first of all, uh, the definition of depression as long as as well as the symptoms as defined by the DSM-5 by the American Psychiatric Association. I'm also going to be talking about the causes of depression. Um, then we're going to talk about the synapse which is a part of the neuron which is really important for understanding neuropsychopharmacology. I'm also going to be talking about the different treatments that are available and then lastly I'm going to be talking about the role the hippocampus plays in depression, which is what I believe to be, and many others believe to be, the uh, new paradigm in neuroscience treatment of depression. So what is depression? According to the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostics and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, major depressive disorder, or MDD, is characterized by at least two weeks of persistently lowered mood, which could be characterized by anhedonia, which is the um, lack of will or will to live, lethargy and pain. In order to be um, diagnosed with major depressive disorder, uh, an individual must have at least five of uh, depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day as indicated by either subjective report, for example, feeling sad, empty, hopeless, or observations made by others, example, feeling tearful. It's important to note that in children and adolescents, this can be seen as just irritable mood. Um, there will be, there has to be a must, sorry, a markedly diminished interest in pleasure in all or almost all activities, most of the day, nearly every day, as indicated by either subjective account or observation. A significant weight loss while not dieting or weight gain, for example, a change in more than 5% of body weight in a month or decreased or increased appetite nearly every day. It's important to note that in children, um, it's quite expected for them to have um, weight gain during times when they're uh, maturing. So it's a little bit difficult to um, uh, diagnose depression in children on the basis of weight gain because that's a time when people are gaining weight and maturing. Um, insomnia or hypersomnia nearly every day, psychomotor agitation or retardation nearly every day, observable by others, not merely subjective feelings or restlessness or being slowed down, fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day, feelings of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt, which may be delusional nearly every day, not merely self-reproach or guilt about being sick. Diminished ability to think or concentrate, or indecisiveness nearly every day, either by subjective account or as observed by others. And lastly, recurring thoughts of death. And this is not just about the fear of dying, it's recurrent suicidal ideation without a specific plan or a suicide attempt or a specific plan for committing suicide. It's important to note that I've highlighted uh, in bold the first two, depressed mood and diminished interest or pleasure, because as well as having five of the uh, ladder in the list, um, an individual must exhibit at least one of the first two. It's important to note that the mood depression is quite different from major depressive disorder. Um, of course, everyone occasionally feels down or, or depressed sometimes. This is usually in response to a tragedy or an event or something that's happened. Um, however, compared to major depressive disorder, um, the depressed mood is generally uh, short-lived um, and isn't characterized by all of the um, symptoms that I suggested. And again, it has to be going on for at least two weeks. So here are some of the signs and symptoms of depression. Um, as you can see, it's pretty complicated and intricate. Um, typically, most people will hear something along the lines of depression being caused solely by a chemical imbalance in the brain. And indeed, that's true that chemicals play a vital role in um, 
phenomenological consciousness. However, it's not that simplistic, and it's a bit of a fallacy to reduce it to a simple to a singular cause because many different factors interrelate. You can see here, just on the right, there. I'm not going to read it all, but you can see different situations such as loss, isolation, conflict, and stress, negative th thoughts and thinking patterns and recursive beliefs, um, emotions, physical states, your actions, all of these interrelate and connect. And um, there are lots of different factors that interrelate into making someone depressed. Um, so the telltale signs of depression, obviously people who have a loss of interest in hobbies or activities, people who have insomnia, people who are uh, consistently anxious, again, suicidal ideation and thoughts, feeling of hopelessness, loss of appetite, worthlessness, irritability, and feeling fatigued. So the causes. So there are two major um, models in health. One is the uh, biological model of health, and one is the biopsychosocial model of health, which tends to be more interactive. Um, the biological cause is uh, firstly genetic. There is a, um, a gene which is 5-HTT-LPR. This is the serotonin transporter linked polymorphic region. Uh, this codes for serotonin, which is a really important neurotransmitter in the brain. And we found that in depressed individuals, uh, they actually have shorter alleles on the gene which code for this, um, which code for the protein, which code for serotonin, sorry. Um, BDNF, this is the brain derived neurotrophic factor protein. Uh, this is really important in neurogenesis, which is basically just a fancy way of saying um, neurogenesis is the um, proliferation of uh, brain cells. And this is actually what goes on in what I'm talking about later on, which is the um, in regards to the hippocampus. Um, and also neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine and norepinephrine. So some of the social or environmental uh, factors include childhood trauma. Um, childhood trauma is really important because this is a time when, when you're a child, when the brain is highly plastic and it's learning um, its behaviors in response to stimulus. And so if someone has had a very traumatic childhood, that's going to be hardwired into their brain later in life. So it's really important that during childhood uh, age that, um, uh, really important that the child has a lot of um, enriching stimulus uh, during those years and there isn't a lot of trauma going on because that can really impact them later in life. Also sustained stress. Um, this is something that is really highly correlated with shrinkage in certain parts of the brain which I'm going to talk about soon. Um, this is in response physically to cortisol and gluco other glucocorticoids. Uh, substance abuse such as alcohol and other drugs, everyone knows this, and also multimorbidity. It's actually been shown that patients who have multiple other illnesses, actually the more illnesses that you have, the higher rates of depression. So someone who has, for example, cancer and obesity and another ailment, the more elements that you have, the higher likelihood you are to actually have depression. So what is the synapse? The synapse is a chemical messenger site between two neurons. It's where the presynaptic neuron is able to send information, quote unquote, to the postsynaptic neuron. Um, this is in response to an action potential, which is basically just an electrochemical gradient that travels along the um, axon, almost a dendrite then. <laughs> um, then vesicles release uh, neurotransmitters to the receptor site. Um, the, according to the monoamine theory, uh, serotonin is diminished um, and so it uses reuptake inhibitors so that serotonin basically, how do I describe it? SNRIs and SSRIs, serotonin reuptake inhibitors and serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, basically stop the serotonin from being reuptaken by the presynaptic neuron and it actually keeps it onto the receptor site on the postsynaptic neuron. So what are some treatments for depression? Obviously, everyone knows about medication. I really want to stress that medication is actually best used in conjunction with other therapies. The more treatments you use at once at the same time, the more holistic it is, the better the outcome. Um, so what type of medications are there? There are 
SNRIs, which are serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. There are SSRIs, which is serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, MAOIs, which are monoamine oxate oxidase inhibitors. And there are tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, the former two are the most uh, recent, uh, recently produced uh, medications. The latter two generally have quite a lot of, although they work very well, they do have quite a lot of um, mm, negative uh, impacts and contraindications. Uh, in severe cases, um, oh, and I forgot to list one, there's also lithium that can be taken, but there are a lot of contraindications with that one. Uh, electroconvulsive therapy, that should be ECT, not ETC. Uh, this is used in severe cases. And this is where you actually basically, in layman's terms, shock the actual physical brain with electrical currents. Uh, therapies include psychological, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, talking therapy, and counseling. Uh, there's mindfulness or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, where you base, it's almost like meditation, and uh, lifestyle managements. Okay, so now up to my favorite one. What is the hippocampus? So the hippocampus is a part of the brain which regulates uh, mood, memory, and emotion. It's important for the formation of short-term memory into long-term memory. And it's located like a little shoe horse, shoe horn thing around the limbic system, which is basically an inner part of the brain. Actually, the name of the hippocampus is derived from, I think, the Greek word for seahorse, I believe. Um, and it's been found that in depressed individual, it's significantly smaller, up to about 5%. Fortunately, uh, not all is lost. This ablation can be uh, countered by therapies, and it's actually been shown that patients who undergo remission have what's called neurogenesis, which is what I described before. Um, in the dentate gyrus, um, P2021 CIP1, which is a cyclin dependent um, kinase inhibitor, um, this actually inhibits the G1 to S phase in mitosis, and it inhibits cell proliferation in the subgranular zone of the hippocampus. Um, since patients who undergo depression um, have this area of the brain actually regrow, it's suggested that therapies, such as tricyclic antidepressants, it's been shown, um, actually inhibit P21 CIP1, which inhibits cell proliferation. So Logically speaking, it seems as though that inhibiting the inhibitor would allow the actual hippocampus to regrow. This is a pretty new area um, in neuropsychopharmacology. And so part of my research is focusing on medications and other therapies that help to regrow this part of the brain. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to my lecture. And if you have any questions, uh, please email me on the homepage.